This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. An Al Jazeera correspondent in Beirut said that the sporadic gunfire clashes have taken place in the area between Bab el Tabania and Jabal Mohsen. Tripoli's Mufti, Sheikh Malik al Shahar, announced that a ceasefire agreement was reached there. These clashes killed two people and injured more than 10 others. لا تكاد مدينة طرابلس في شمال لبنان تعرف أياما قليلة من الهدوء الملحوظ حتى تعود عجلة التوتر والاشتباكات لتؤرق The Lebanese city of Tripoli in northern Lebanon had a few days of notable calm only to be followed by tension and clashes which have become a source of concern to its residents. The latest ceasefire agreement which was reached in the middle of last month did not last long. The two contesting sides returned to the language of weapons last night. Clashes erupted between the Sunni-dominated Bab al-Tabena and Shiite-dominated Jab al-Muhsin, during which rocket-propelled grenades and machine gunfire was exchanged. As usual, the clashes injured a number of people, including civilians who happened to be in the area. The clashes also left material damages and caused fires at some of the properties. The civilians were forced to leave their homes since their homes were caught in the crossfire during the clashes. The Lebanese army moved on the ground to give additional support to its units that were deployed in the two areas in order to end the clashes. Meanwhile, mediation efforts to establish calm are ongoing. Until today, the events on the ground have shown that all the ceasefire agreements between Bab al-Tabena and Jabal Mohsen are weak and can collapse at any time. The recent events that storm Lebanon triggered these clashes last May in these two areas where the demography of the population and their political orientation are at odds. Joining us from the Lebanese city in northern Lebanon, Salam Haler. Salam, how are things going? Has the ceasefire agreement taken effect on the ground? We can't say that the ceasefire agreement is being implemented in a comprehensive manner. We still hear the sound of sporadic machine guns and light weapons. The ceasefire has not come into effect in a complete and final way. This comes despite the fact that Tripoli's Mufti, Sheikh Malik al Shaar, had told us that the ceasefire that was reached between Bab al Tabena and Jab al Mohsen would take effect at 1 p.m. two hours ago. However, the intensity of the clashes has dramatically decreased. We are no longer talking about clashes, we are talking about sporadic gunfire. So far, two people were killed and more than 10 others were injured. Some of the victims were injured as they were passing by. Of course, the mediations are still ongoing. The Mufti of Tripoli is trying to mediate between the leaders in Bab al-Tabena and Jab al-Mohsen to prevent the return of clashes and establish calm. Libya sets a historic precedent by demanding compensation from Italy for damages sustained by the country during the colonial era. This opens the door for other countries in the south to also demand compensation from colonial powers. The Libyan leader's eldest, Saif al-Islam, gave a speech yesterday in Tripoli, which was broadcast live on Libyan television. Saif al-Islam said that an agreement in this regard with Italy will be signed within weeks. He said that compensation, which will be in the billions 
millions will be spent on several projects, including the construction of a highway running through Libya and other educational projects, in addition to projects to clear out the landmines that were planted during the colonial era. Of course, we are talking about large amounts of money, estimated in the billions. This money will be used for education. Hundreds of educational grants will be given out. Also, the money will be used for the construction of a coastal road linking the Tunisian-Libyan border to the Egyptian-Libyan border, in addition to clearing landmines. Truly, this is an historical project. Even our brothers in Algeria have said, please hurry up with this project, because this will set a new precedent for the countries in the south. These countries must receive an apology and compensation. Saif al-Islam al-Qaddafi also demanded compensation from the U.S. He said that his country will not resolve the outstanding issues with Washington and demanded that the U.S. compensate the Libyan victims of the American air raids that were launched on Tripoli and Benghazi in 1986. At the time, these raids killed 41 civilians, including one of al-Qaddafi's daughters, and injured 220 others. اهلا بكم من جديد وتابع في نهايه الاسبوع كشفت وزاره الخارجيه الامريكيه عن عدم وجود According to the US State Department there were no plans to schedule a meeting between a Syrian academic delegation visiting the United States and the assistant secretary for Near Eastern Affairs David Welch The head of the Syrian delegation Riyad Daoudi pulled out from the visit to Washington at the last minute due to a scheduled meeting in Damascus with a Turkish representative according to the official story one of the delegation members had also announced a scheduled meeting with some members of the U.S. Congress. The visit by the Syrian delegation to the United States was hosted by an international governmental organization based in Washington and Brussels. The reason for the visit was to attend a seminar organized by the Brookings Institute about including Syria in new international negotiations. Daoudi is the highest level Syrian negotiator in the indirect talks with Israel under Turkish mediation. To comment on this topic, we are joined from Damascus by Dr. Ibrahim al Daraji, Professor of International Law. Welcome and thank you for joining us. It was said that the Syrian delegation asked to meet members of AIPAC. We'd like to get more information about this. Could it be true? No, definitely not. This is an unofficial delegation. Yesterday, Dr. Samir Tiki, the head of the delegation, talked very clearly about this. He said that there was no request for such a meeting. And when he was asked about the confusion around this topic, he was very clear. He said that perhaps the organizers of the visit were thinking about such a meeting in the initial planning phase. But the Syrian delegation's position since before coming to the U.S. was clear about its complete rejection of conducting such a meeting. Therefore, there was no confusion and there was no date set for such a meeting. How about the meeting with U.S. officials? Yesterday, I was on a U.S. station, and the spokeswoman for the U.S. State Department clearly stated that the State Department was expecting that meeting might be possible with the assistant secretary. But due to conflicts in scheduling, these meetings were cancelled. But this was not based on a request by the Syrian delegation. Also, the visits made by academic delegations are coordinated with the host organization, which schedules meetings and creates a work schedule. Therefore, there was no request made by Syria and no U.S. rejection or acceptance. The Americans said that there was a conflict of schedules. This is their opinion, whether it is true or not. Mm -hmm. Although we know Americans as being more detail-oriented. This is what they said. Many high-level international agreements began with academic initiatives. Also, when the relations began improving between countries, it is not usually the officials that are concerned in the beginning. Of course, they would be supported politically, but they come as academic initiatives. Does the Syrian topic take that approach this time with the U.S. or Israel? First of all, in regards to Israel, we do not need academic meetings because there are indirect relations taking place visibly and clearly. 
can hona but such initiatives had paved the way for these negotiations right there were initiatives there was nothing academic the media outlets said many things about this, but Syria clearly stated that there was nothing taking place. This is especially the case as Syria called on resuming the peace process in public, so it did not have to do anything in secret. This is in regards to the Israeli side. This topic was greatly discussed in the media outlets, but the Syrian story is clear. In regards to the U.S. side, again, so that we do not exaggerate or underestimate this visit, this visit is within the framework of various academic meetings and that have taken place even in the past years. Academic delegations had come to Syria and met with Syrian officials and leaders. This falls within the same framework. It is important to realize that it was the USA which took the decision to cut ties with Syria. So maybe the issue should simply be regarded from its pure academic angle, since there are no official meetings within it. So this visit and these meetings, let's talk about them away from the political jargon. In regards to international relations, this visit means that the relations between Damascus and Washington are starting to take the right path, if we can use that term, correct? We want this since warming the U.S.-Syrian relations would serve the principles and interests of Syria. There is no phase in which Syria wanted to have hostility with the U.S. on the condition that the U.S. understands the principles, the rights and interests of Syrian policy. Some people might think that this visit is within that framework. Maybe it is an indirect U.S. message to Syria to show that it is somehow opening to Syrian policy. But from an official Syrian standpoint, and I say, officially, Syria is not giving this visit more weight than it's due. Syria says, if there's a desire by the U.S. to reopen relations, then the path is clear, which is through direct and official calls between the embassies. There is a Syrian embassy in Washington, and the Americans know its address and its ambassador directly. I do not personally think that the Americans want to transmit this message, which is proved by this tension in regards to setting a meeting date and then canceling it. Syria was not the one who asked for these meetings, and the Americans withdrew this prospect, so we cannot give this issue more than its content. This does not mean that Syria is drawing an example from this visit, but this is the truth of the situation. The predominant Shiite cleric in Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Nimr Bakr al-Nimr, warned of clashes erupting between the Shiite Muslims and the authorities in the country if the Shiites' demands are unheeded. He said it was their right to benefit from the help of any external power, including Iran. This call by the Shiite Saudi cleric was not heard in the royal palaces because the palace owners were busy opening up to the world's religions in Spain. However, their priority should have been to create religious tolerance inside the country and include the religions in the country itself. This includes giving the Saudi Shiites their rights because Iran is the second option they are being pushed towards. The Shiites in the kingdom are not few. Their numbers equal the total population of Lebanon. But they are deprived of their rights and cannot hold prominent positions. In the north of the capital, they are closer to the Saudi kings and princesses than those in Madrid. Libya stopped supplying Switzerland with oil and prohibited the issuing of entry visas to Swiss nationals. This was in protest against detaining the son of al Qatafi. Last week, Hani Bal, the son of Libyan President Muammar al Qaddafi, was detained in Switzerland for two days. Hani and his wife were charged with mistreating their two servants. Hundreds of Libyan demonstrators gathered outside the Swiss embassy, calling on Geneva to apologize for detaining al Qaddafi. <laughs> Harming him or one of his sons is a red line whose crossing is death. We warn and we threaten. Make a formal apology or you will be subjected to severe procedures against you, your interests and relations with the Great Republic. The Swiss Foreign Ministry sent an envoy to Libya to stop a crisis from occurring between the two countries. This came after threats were made about cutting relations with Switzerland on all levels. This led to the Swiss ambassador to explain. There was absolutely no intention in this sensitive matter to hurt the feelings of the Libyan people or the leader's family. 
I want to emphasize this. I have been following this case in my embassy since it began, to the extent that none of the people working there could sleep. They followed the case non-stop to stop the situation from getting worse. Libya had suspended the granting of entry visas to Swiss citizens to Tripoli since the incident occurred on July 15th of this year. U.S. National Security Council advisor has told Al Jazeera the Bush administration looked the other way while Afghan drug lords went about their business in the early days of the post-Taliban government. And the accusations follow claims by a former counter-narcotics official that President Hamid Karzai is in fact blocking efforts to tackle the country's drugs problem. Zaina Awad has more. Afghanistan is making its way back to the top of the U.S. agenda with more and more American soldiers losing their lives there by the day. But Afghanistan comes with an old, unresolved dilemma. What to do about poppy seed cultivation, a business worth billions of dollars and one that supplies the world with the overwhelming majority of its heroin. Now, in an upcoming U.S. media report, former Bush administration counter-narcotic official Thomas Schweich alleges that the Karzai government itself is implicated in the opium trade at the highest level. The U.S. administration has always known about this, and it did nothing. In an extraordinary admission to Al Jazeera, former U.S. National Security Council director for Afghanistan confirmed this on record. Certainly when I worked this issue at the White House in 2001, 2002, we were made aware, very clearly aware, that the highest government officials, including the Minister of Defense at the time, were drug traffickers. And there was a serious question about what would we, what would we do, how would we get aid into Afghanistan and deal with this Afghan government. The report also points out that instead of fighting drugs and corruption, Karzai appointed Aizatullah Wasifi, a convicted heroin dealer, to his inner circle in government as anti-corruption committee head. Karzai was quick to deny the charges, saying, Afghanistan never takes the blame for the drugs threat. Without a doubt, some Afghans are drug smugglers, but the majority of them are the international mafia who do not live in Afghanistan. But the report insists that the drug mafia is primarily local and deeply integrated into the government. The U.S. administration decided to ignore this overarching reality. Drugs, it said at the time, was not their problem to sort. A decision, many argue, that's cost Afghanistan dearly as communities across the country battle addiction and poverty. Zaina Awad, Al Jazeera. Let's go live to Valencia in Spain and speak to Yorick Kaminga, who's from the international policy think tank, the Senlis Council. Mr. Kaminga, many thanks for your time. I guess the crux of this whole report that we've seen in the uh, New York Times newspaper is that drugs was never an issue for the United States in Afghanistan. I guess my first question is, do you agree with that? And if so, why was it never an issue? Well, first of all, uh, it's, it's the classic case, what we see now, of uh, former officials coming out with stories uh, that basically justify their own misguided policies by blaming, putting the blame on others, in this case, uh, the Pentagon and uh, the Afghan government. Um, definitely what we should do is to avoid this kind of blame game. That's not what uh, the Afghans need, what the Afghan population need. Instead, we should really indeed ask the question, um, what have we done in the past few years when it comes to counter narcotics and have our policies actually made things worse and that's really definitely the case so I would really uh, urge also the next uh, US administration to really focus on that question what can we do to overhaul now counter narcotics uh, policies as they are implemented to really come to, uh, up with an approach that doesn't uh, increase poverty and that doesn't really uh, fuel the inf insurgency. But is there at least the basis of an anti-narcotics program in place or does it need to be completely stripped away and started again? Yeah, we should really start, uh, go back to the drawing board and start again. We should not forget that this is not an Afghan policy that is in place. It's a US inspired uh, policy based on the US war on drugs. Um, which obviously is an outdated uh, U.S. policy model that hasn't worked anywhere in the world. So that's the first start. W uh, that's also why we really can't blame the, the Afghan government for this, because um, this program, the U.S. model, is run through the ministries in Afghanistan that are funded by the U.S. and other international uh, money. And uh, we're also funding the e expertise, the advisors, and the people even on the ground, uh, for example, in the south, that are coordinating the policies, the eradication policies that are 
have been completely ineffective. But does are the, a part the Afghan of, government, of the, the private military? Or, sorry to interrupt you. Sorry? Does the Afghan government itself? not have some accountability here for, uh, as I've read through the report, not taking advantage of things like the aerial spraying and things like that and not actually putting into place some good ideas that were there from the US administration. Well, of course, there is joint uh, responsibility, and in fact, it should be first and foremost uh, the, the ownership of the Afghan government on this issue. However, as, as you call it, the option of uh, aerial spraying, that uh, is, is one of the few good steps that actually the, the Afghan government hasn't done, because that would, of course, spell utter disaster for our uh, current uh, policies of winning the hearts and minds of the people, and that would further boost the, the, the current insurgency. On the other hand, of course, we should indeed look into different options that we have. And, and our one option is obviously the, the Poppy for Medicine model that our organization, the Sanders Council, has been advocating for. We should need more political will to indeed investigate whether uh, innovative policies are possible and whether we can indeed use uh, the, the illegal or part of the illegal opium for uh, uh, the production of Afghan-made uh, uh, morphine, for example. وفي مجال الثقافة والتراث الحضاري تسخر العاصمة المغربية الرباط. The Moroccan capital of Rabat has many historic sites that date back to different historic eras. المواقع الأثرية المكتشفة دلت على وجود الموريين أو ما يعرف. These historic sites have the thumbprints of the Moors or the ancient people of Morocco, the Roman Empire and the Islamic era. Rabat was the political capital for many Muslim kings from Morocco. The historic site of Shella is the first nucleus of Rabat. Excavations have uncovered the remains of Sad, which was inhabited by the Moors or the ancient people of Morocco between the 2nd century BC and the 1st century AD. Also, the site has remains from Salah, which was built by the Romans who settled there until the 4th century AD. The Roman city of Sala was built on the rubble of the Moorish city of Saad. The diggings uncovered a public neighborhood which has many buildings including Al-Azala, a palace, and an official temple. The Islamic expansions reached Rabat in the 7th century AD. The city was subjected to constant attacks by the Mazir tribes from the south. This pushed Sultan bin Tashafin to build the first military castle on the coastal area near the Atlantic Ocean in the 12th century AD. Sultan Mu'min al Muhdi built the city of Al Mahdiya, or what is known as Qasbat al Wadiya, which was a strong defense against external attacks. After the Burkhwata was defeated in the era of Abu Mumin and the tribes of Burkhwata were eliminated, the city of Al Mahdiya or Qasabat al Wadaya became a place where the Muhajideen gathered to fight the Christian expansion from Spain, which at the time was viewed as an external threat. Starting from Qasbat al Wadiya, a two-kilometer wall was built to fortify the city. The wall has five huge gates, including Lula' Al Had and Al Ruwaha gates. By the end of the 12th century AD, the mosque of Hassan was built. Nothing is left from that mosque but its minaret, which is similar to the minaret of the Khiralda Mosque in Ashbilia. Its size is an indication of how large this Islamic building was. In the 14th century, the Moors built a mosque and a school in Shella. Also, the kings and important figures from Beni Marine were buried there. The people of Rabat are Arabs and Moors who came from Spain. Most of them live in the old city, which still has historic buildings. The main source of income for these residents are traditional arts and crafts. Barack Obama is treated like a rock star in Berlin, as many European capitals are gripped by Obama mania. But how was he received in the Middle East? And why did he refer to the Berlin Wall, but not to Israel's separation wall? Answers to these questions and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. 
There are similarities between Senator Barack Obama's visits to Jordan and Germany. Mr. Obama has chosen historic backgrounds for his outdoor appearances. In Germany, Mr. Obama spoke to an adoring crowd just a few feet away from where the Berlin Wall once stood. In Jordan, the senator held his first public event near the Temple of Hercules, part of the citadel complex on a hill overlooking Amman, the capital. The audience, however, consisted of an army of reporters, most of whom had traveled with the senator from the United States, with few local ones amongst them. A small gathering of onlookers was kept at bay by the Jordanian security forces. Obama mania was not present. According to a recent survey from the Pew Research Center, only 22% of Jordanians who are following the U.S. presidential election have confidence in the senator from Illinois. Many Arabs believe that U.S. foreign policy will not change for the better with a new president, according to the same report. The reason, in my opinion, is because most Arabs do not see the U.S. as an honest broker in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If there is any sense of responsibility on the part of the U.S., not just for our own sake, even for its own interest, then there has to be a formulation of a new and bold and positive policy that does not uh, subject American interests to Israeli policies. During the early months of the presidential primaries, there was an immense amount of enthusiasm for Obama's candidacy in the Arab world and press. But during my recent travels to the Middle East, I found that although Obama fares much better than his rival John McCain, this early enthusiasm has been replaced by skepticism. And Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel and it must remain undivided. The skepticism began by the senator's statements on the status of Jerusalem in front of a Jewish American audience at APAC's annual conference. His recent visit to Israel and the West Bank only exacerbated this and was viewed by many as one-sided. Senator Obama spent most of his time during this stop reaffirming his commitment to Israel and performing rituals expected by all dignitaries when visiting the country. In his brief visit to the West Bank city of Ramallah, Obama expressed strong support for the creation of an independent Palestinian state, something Palestinians have heard endlessly for the past several years. If elected, he said, he will work from the first day in the White House to find a solution to the Palestinian issue. Okay, that's new. America must always stand up for Israel's right to defend itself against those who threaten its people. The stark imbalance was seen in Obama's indifference to the Palestinian suffering under Israeli occupation. For example, there is nothing wrong with Obama's visit to the town of Zderot, where its residents are subjected to Hamas's Qassam rocket barrages. But Obama could have made a stop at the Palestinian town of Kalkilia and witnessed firsthand an entire population living in fear like caged animals behind Israel's separation wall. But he didn't. Last night, I watched Obama making his speech in Berlin, where the infamous wall once stood. The walls between the countries with the most and those with the least cannot stand. The walls between races and tribes, natives and immigrants, Christians and Muslims and Jews cannot stand. These now are the walls we must tear down. I imagined him delivering the same speech with the separation wall Israel has created in the Jerusalem suburb of Abu Dis in the background, but it was only a fleeting fantasy. I'm Jamal Dajani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. To learn more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash mosaic. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you.
This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.